good memories of being there. Yeah. It is, we've got a, we, we have 20, 24 people here and it is past the 9.30 start time. So I think um, without more, too much more casual chit chat, I'm gonna turn it over to Jenna to introduce today's speaker. Great, yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, so welcome everyone to our, our final eco-informatics seminar. Um, Dr. Jacqueline Gill is an associate professor of paleoecology at the University of Maine. She has joint appointments in the School of Biology and Ecology and the Climate Change Institute, in addition to leading the BEAST Lab, which explores important questions regarding extinctions, ecological dynamics, and climate change. She received her BS in Human Ecology at the University of the Atlantic in 2005 and her PhD in 2012 at the University of Wisconsin, where she studied the extinction of giant animals from the Pleistocene and how that defunation affect the surrounding vegetation. After receiving her PhD, she became the Voss Postdoctoral Fellow at Brown University. Dr. Gill has won numerous awards, including the Lucy Braun Award for Excellence in Ecology, the Ecological Society of America Cooper Award, and the Whitbeck Dissertator Fellowship at the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Gill has investigated the terrestrial marine linkages to global change, how species um, will manage the dynamics of a changing climate, and how ice age food webs um, respond to environmental fluctuations. Her research has been recognized in multiple high tier journals, such as Science, PNAS, and Bioscience. Additionally, she has forged relationships with archaeologists, conservationists, and Native communities from around the globe throughout her career. Finally, Dr. Gill co-hosts the climate change podcast, Warm Regards, and is passionate about science communication and increasing diversity in STEM. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Gill to our final Equinformatics seminar today. Um, before we get started, I just have a few questions for you regarding your journey in science, if that's okay. Oh, please. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Yeah, we kind of start off the seminars with some of these questions. I think it helps some of us graduate students and figuring yeah. out the paths. Um, so yeah, first off, um, why did you choose a, a career in science and was it always something that you were interested in? I would say I was always interested in everything um, and especially the natural world and um, growing up kind of as a kid in the 80s and 90s, um, I, I like to think of it as sort of the, the Captain Planet generation. Um, the, con the concerns were different then than they are now in a lot of ways, but um, I think it, it was something that was always on my mind um, as sort of a planet conscious kid. Um, and so I actually thought I was going to, well, I, I had a very circuitous path. Um, I thought I was going to go into history or the humanities. I was, I wanted to be a photojournalist for a while. And then in, in high school, I was pretty set on theater. Um, and it was through a, just a series of really chance encounters, um, that, you know, brought me back and actually really good, some really good history teachers and really poor science teachers, unfortunately. Um, that set me into thinking about human relationships with nature, um, but I was thinking about it more in terms of anthropology or history and sort of trying to understand, you know, where we went wrong, like where did this sort of relationship diverge? Um, and basically my, the first college that I went to closed its campuses and I ended up at College of the Atlantic and uh, really felt adrift in a lot of ways, having sort of a, you know, th those early existential crises you can have in your early 20s, um, just trying to figure out what am I going to do? How can I best make a contribution? And I took a conservation biology course, um, a history course, and a philosophy course, because uh, we're in a trimester system. And I was like, all right, this is it. Whatever class I identify with the most, that's going to make you know, that's going to set my, my life path, which is not a really good way to, to make your choices. But it, for me, it ended up working out in that the conservation biology course that I took um, got me really kind of reinvigorated my interest in the environment. And then I took an ecology course the semester or the trimester after that. And that's when I started to learn about, uh, because we were in Bar Harbor, Maine, um, which is a wonderful, you know, heavily glaciated landscape, um, lots of you know, imprints of past sea level and glaciers everywhere. Um, and just being in that natural laboratory, I started to realize just how much our understanding of these protected areas and the, the species we're trying to conserve uh, really relies on this short-term snapshot, this, this sort of very narrow understanding of the environment. And that got me hooked in, in these deeper time um, uh, sort of questions. And that allowed me to then branch out and 
uh, do a little bit of everything from geology and chemistry to anthropology um, and to tie all that into my interests in ecology um, with a conservation relevance. So I, in the end, I never had to make a decision really. It was, it was, it worked out. <laughs> so. Yeah, it really sounded like it did. That's, that's a fascinating kind of decision-making process too. <laughs> I think yeah. it would help all of us, yeah. yeah. Um, so next question is what skill set do you think was the most useful for you in your career? Oh, such a great question. Um, and it's funny giving this talk to an eco-informatics group, um, but I, I still have uh, s serious um, insecurities about my quantitative skills, about uh, modeling um, and, you know, my coding abilities, you know, you know my code is super messy. Um, but I have always felt like I am, so I've made peace with that actually over time, because as I talk to more people who have strengths in those skills, I've come to appreciate that um, my ability to read deeply and broadly and draw connections, um, a lot, and uh, that helps me uh, think across temporal and spatial scales, which is not intuitive for everyone. Um, to, you know, as a ge trained geographer, which is actually my graduate degrees, um, I've been exposed to a lot of different kinds of literature. Um, and that sort of liberal arts background, I would say, um, and, a, and just a passion and, a, and, a, and an interest in interdisciplinarity, um, I think has served me really well in terms of being question driven, um, collaborating, etc. So I think we, we have a tendency nowadays to focus really heavily on, you know, I want to get the most, um, the, the cutting edge skills in this, uh, uh, you know, in this type of modeling or in, I want to learn the newest programming language. Um, and all of those can be really valuable, especially in the job market. But I would, I would also encourage people to, um, to just cultivate a, an interest in, in reading and, um, and thinking broadly and deeply across disciplines. Uh, and, and, and I, and I, you might think, well, that's not a skill, but it is, I mean, it is a skill to, uh, to, to, to engage in a different kind of literature, whether that's the philosophy of science or social justice literature um, or um, you know, anthropology or you know, geography discourse um, as, as an ecologist. Um, I think all of those have brought really valuable perspectives to, uh, to the research that I do. Yeah, I think that's a great answer too. I, I actually I went to a liberal arts college. And so now I'm coming here and doing all the, the data analysis and learning these new te techniques. I think it's good to have both skills for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, last question is, what is the most common mistake that PhD students make when choosing their career path, do you think? Oh my gosh, um, choosing a career path. That's interesting. Um, I think the most common mistake people make is thinking that that a pathway is uh, or that paths are straight lines rather than braided uh, connected. I mean, I think a braided river is a better metaphor. Um, it's it's not like a hiking trail that just goes up to the top, right? And um, there are you're you're more marketable in many different fields than you think. Um, no decision that you make is going to shut all the doors and set you on in one direction. Um, there's a lot more flexibility than you might realize. And you're not necessarily trained to think that way. Um, you, you know, you're not maybe even socialized to think that way by, you know, maybe our parents or other people who care about us and who want us to make all the right choices, you know, so that we don't have financial stress or, you know, maybe we have a community that has supported us that we need to give back to. Um, but, you know, every decision feels really fraught. And I would say that um, you know, be open to, to chance and, um, and changing your pathway and you can have some agency over that. It doesn't have to just be reactive. Um, but you know, there are, if, if you think, if you got into this path thinking, I am going to be an R1 research faculty member, um, and then halfway through you decide that your passions lie elsewhere, um, that's okay and it's good and we need people like you with your skill sets in all kinds of places whether we're talking about you know congressional as congressional staffers or as um, you know as teachers or as um, science communicators um, people with your skill sets and your backgrounds are valuable everywhere and it just it's it's not a matter of retraining yourself or abandoning your pathway it's just a matter of thinking about all the things that you do uh, whether that's communicating or project management or um, writing, you know, all of those skills that you're picking up, um, data visualization, um, they're incredibly valuable and, uh, and you should own that. 
yeah, I really love that answer. Well, thank you so much, and uh, invite you to begin your your presentation. So, thank sorry, you. just just before we get started, <laughs> <laughs> I just have I, I'm just um, uh, I'm here as as uh, Kim's enforcer to request that people please click the link in the chat uh, chat menu to or chat window uh, for signing into the seminar so we can keep track of participation. We've got some people who've not been here before, and just to explain, we keep track of attendance. Um, at these seminars so we can report to NSF on our um, as part of our T3 annual report on how we are having how this seminar is having reach not only across um, our program but across campus so please 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 um, don't make me interrupt this seminar again <laughs> it's completely <laughs> full form it takes the <laughs> no well I think uh, Kim will take care of you Jacqueline <laughs> but um, everyone else uh, Thank you um, for doing that. And um, I was going to put this into the the, the text um, as well, but I just wanted to, Jenna and uh, Jacqueline. That was really that was one of the best Q and A career trajectory discussions we've had. So uh, thanks for thanks for that. That was really insightful comments. And thank you for finishing the semester on a high note. There, um, I, it's really been a a great um, great discussion through the semester. But uh, you really showed us, um, gave us some great advice for the early career scientists. So thank you. And we'll now turn the podium over to you. Okay, well, thank you. I'm glad it was helpful. Um, yeah, it's it's funny. It's not, a, it's not a tidy process, but I think it's good to own that. Because um, uh, whose is, right? Um, all right, let's get over here. The obligatory, how many tabs and windows do I need to go share screen and go. All right. So uh, when I was asked about giving a sort of quasi-research, quasi-science communication presentation, um, it, it, I, I spent a lot, a lot of time thinking about what would be really useful and beneficial. And I decided that, um, I, that it, I think it would be fun to talk about storytelling, um, which is going to be challenging for a lot of us, right? Especially those of us who work with data um, and, uh, uh, or large data sets and data driven projects, um, you know, and, and so I wanted to share some insights and, and sort of show by example, some of the ways in which um, I have grappled with these communication challenges um, and the things that I've learned along the way. And I actually do have a little syllabus that I can share that has some readings. There are references to back up the things I'm saying. Um, I, as just to, for my own you know, statement of positionality, I am not a science communication researcher. I don't do this um, as, a, as, a, as, as my field. This is just a field that I've engaged in. Um, I've read in uh, widely to inform my own communication efforts as a scientist. Um, and the reasons that I have come to be a science communicator are, are deeply personal, just as all of yours will be. Um, and so I encourage you to kind of lean into the reasons and the motivations that are driving your own interest in science communication. And for me, a lot of it comes down to being a first generation uh, college student who came from a working class background, um, who uh, you know didn't see a lot of scientists who looked like me growing up. Um, and also feeling very much like, you know, maybe this is something about growing up in, uh, you know, sort of working class backgrounds or growing up in poverty, but um, feeling very much, you know, as I, as I went into this process of, especially as a graduate student, realizing I was, I was funded by taxpayers, I felt very strongly that I had this, um, this duty, this responsibility to give back to the communities that were supporting my, my work and my research. I think at one point I tallied up just how much I cost, you know, like the the state or the country, um, just just to go through graduate school in, in terms of my tuition and my research and every and my stipend and everything else, and and that was very humbling and sobering. Um, even though we're not necessarily paid enough as graduate students, um, it was for me still this moment of like, okay, well, this is an investment I've been invested in by people um, who are trusting me to do this work, and so I need to give back. And so I encourage you to to take a moment and be existential about what drew you to this pathway? Why, you know, why do you feel like you need to be a science communicator? Maybe you don't, and maybe this will make you think differently. All right, so the, the title, Tell Me a Story, Ditching Data and Embracing Empathy for Effective Science Communication comes directly out of my own personal experiences, the work I've done with, with my own communication mentors, people like Catherine Hayhoe, and just what works. You know, Whenever you have a hot take about science communication, um, chances are that it's a testable hypothesis and someone's probably already tested it. So if you have strong feelings about what should work or what doesn't, I encourage you to get engaged with the literature because people are testing these questions, um, people who are experts in this, and I'm just a beneficiary of that work. 
Um, all right, so um, why should we do science communication? Well, I shared some of the reasons that I'm strongly motivated to do it um, that are sort of more metaphysical, um, inspiring the next generation of scientists. Um, you know, for a lot of us or people like me included, the reasons why we should do science communication are deeply connected to the reasons that we want to do science, right? Um, pictures like this that I grew up with in my middle school and high school textbooks. Um, for those of you who have not figured out what you're looking at, this is a pile of, of bison skulls from the period of time when European colonizers came and uh, nearly wiped out buffalo or bison uh, from North America, right? So pictures like this, this sort of this conservation near miss, just how close we came from to eliminating one of our only surviving ice age mega herbivores. Um, you know, these are questions that you know deep or, or problems that deeply motivate me and may maybe motivate many of you. The same reasons you wanted to go into science might be a good motivation for science communication. So there are all kinds of reasons, like the survivors of that near miss of extinction, like these bison here. Um, so you might want to be raising awareness about issues, something that's important to you. That's probably why you're doing science to some extent. Um, there may be some, uh, some environmental problem or other issue or public health problem that you care deeply about, and you think other people should too. Um, uh, maybe you want to influence someone's attitude uh, to, to get them to think differently. Um, for a long time, when I was at your career level, we were really concerned about changing public awareness about climate change. That's no longer as much of an issue, right? Now the problem is more, okay, we need to get people to believe that they can do something about it. So the problems might change through time um, as people's beliefs change. Um, so maybe, you know, for you, the issue is I want to, I want people to embrace vaccination, right? Or there may be some other pressing issue that, that's driving your desire to, to communicate your science. Maybe you want to give back. Maybe um, you are working with farmers and you want to help those farmers uh, to improve their yields or, or have better lifestyles. Um, maybe you want to spread joy. That's an okay reason to be a science communicator, um, to spread joy and wonder. Um, you know, especially in the last year where it has felt like, you know, the majority of our science news has been dominated by apocalyptic climate headlines and the pandemic. I don't know about you, but I have struggled to find, you know, just some joyful, inspiring, fun science content out there. And if that's hard for me, it's probably hard for, you know, non-scientists who might not have as many, you know, connections or resources at their, at their disposal. Um, maybe it's a call to action. You know, you don't want someone to just change how you think. You want them to get off of the couch and do something about it. Uh, maybe that's voting. Maybe that's changing their behavior. Um, maybe that's contacting their representatives, um, changing what they eat, whatever it might be. Um, maybe you just want to educate people. People, you know, the public who is funding us, they should be able to make informed decisions um, as, as global citizens, right? Uh, maybe you need to gain resources. You might have funders that you're trying to wrangle more funding from, um, or you are trying to have access to field sites um, or data sets or something like that. So you need to be able to communicate to the, to the stakeholders who you rely on to do your research. Um, and just in general, maybe it's just to serve the public good. You might have some lofty goal of improving, like I said, vaccination rates or something along those lines. There's lots and lots of reasons why you might, and this is not exhaustive, why you might feel compelled to do science communication. Uh, and another really good one is uh, maybe the science itself is not the goal. Maybe the goal is to inspire the next generation of people to become scientists, especially for those who are from underrepresented groups. Maybe if you are a member of a minoritized group, um, maybe you want to you know, show through a representation that scientists don't have to look a certain way. They can look like you, right? And that's really powerful. That, that in itself can be a great goal. All right, so the, the first thing I want you to think about when it comes to um, how to effectively approach science communication um, is, it was right in the title, I already gave it away, the spoiler, right, ditching data. And there's been this persistent problem um, that we've known about for decades, and scientists continue to approach science communication as though this, this is not a problem. And that is this idea that people are empty vessels just waiting to be stuffed up or filled with tasty facts, right? If only people knew as much as we did as scientists, they would change their behavior. They would do the right thing. Um, 
And it turns out there's a name for that, that kind of thinking. It's called the deficit model of science. This idea that people are empty vessels and we're just going to throw them with, you know, bombard them with facts and enough facts will stick and then they will take all those facts and they will go off and, uh, and, and change their behavior or be more educated about an issue that we think they should care about. And people have been researching this for decades and they know, we know this deficit approach doesn't work. Just giving people more facts is not enough. Um, and that is really hard for us to accept, especially those of us who work in universities where our jobs are to educate students, right? In a classroom environment, being told that having more facts or giving away more facts is not effective is deeply disturbing. Um, and, and people will get upset when you tell them this, um, but we've known for a long time that this model of communication doesn't work. And one of the things we have to remember is that most people are not like us in that they didn't go on to, uh, you know, they didn't ex necessarily excel in a classroom environment. They didn't go on to become academics or, or to become researchers or scientists, um, which isn't to say that they can't, it's just that they didn't choose those pathways um, or, or maybe those pathways weren't available to them. Um, but, you know, it, I grew up loving trivia. I love facts. I love trivia games. I love, you know, collecting information. As a kid, I would run around and just, I'd learn something and immediately want to share it with someone else. And I was perpetually confused by the fact that other people were not as excited to have like collected another little fact in their, in their cheek pouches. Um, and, you know, thinking like whoever dies with the most facts wins. And that's, that's just not the case for most people. And you've probably experienced that yourself at some point in, in time. And so we need to ditch this model. We need to stop acting like facts are the most important thing when it comes to science communication. So if facts don't work, what does? Well, it turns out empathy. Um, we are a social storytelling species. We know, again, this is all backed up by empirical research uh, data that empathy increases our likelihood of being believed. So there have been studies that have shown that if you have two people that give the same exact information in a presentation, the person who is more like the audience will be rated higher in their competence in that field, right? So the, the information could be the same, delivered in exactly the same way, but if an in-group person tells me that information, I am more likely to believe them and to rate them as a more competent scientist. And if the outgroup person gives that information to me, I am basically going to downvote their expertise. We've also seen this when it comes to social media. There was a really great study that showed that um, they took a large classroom, like a large intro biology classroom, and they exposed the students to, they broke them into three groups. One group of students got to see a professor's science only tweets. A second group got to see their personal only tweets. So things like, um, here's me and my dog in the backyard, or I'm drinking this great latte. Um, here's a picture of it. And the third group got to see a mix. And then they polled the students to ask them uh, whether the, the instructor was competent in their field or not. And the students that rated the professor's competence the highest were the ones that saw the mix of both the personal and the scientific content. The science only content uh, did not you know, result in that professor being rated the highest. And that's because of the power of empathy. Right, so this idea that we need to build this bridge, this connection between us and our listener, um, because those facts that we're trying to bombard people with, they don't just pass through empty space to us. They pass through all of our filters, all of our preconceived notions, our biases, our identities, our histories, our beliefs, our experiences. All of those things are sort of bending and refracting that light, um, if it were, if you, if you could imagine it, um, so that what comes to us is actually not the same message that's broadcast by the, the person speaking. And, and that's true for, for us as scientists too, incidentally. Um, and so the more empathy we can build with our audience as science communicators, the better we can reach them, the more of those sort of filters that we can, we can remove essentially. And sometimes that empathy means, you know, being really careful about our audience. Um, you know, I am more likely to be an effective speaker if I target my audience as, um, you know, science fiction nerds, right? I'm gonna be less effective if I go talk to a rotary club. Um, or of, of pr primarily white businessmen, right? That's not gonna be an audience that I'm gonna be as effective with, but some of my other colleagues might be able to communicate with them better. So part of it is just, you know, being strategic about who you're talking to. 
we don't always have that luxury. If you have to go talk to um, a bunch of farmers who might be hostile to your message, uh, you might not have a choice. And so what you do then is you have to find common ground, common connections with them. Um, you know, I am not just a first generation college student. I'm also a Navy brat, right? I am also someone who grew up in rural New England, right? There are, there are aspects of my life that I can lean into to, to build those connections with people. In, in ways that are more relatable than I'm a quaternary paleoecologist, right? That's not something that's necessarily going to be on people's radar. And then the other thing we can do, um, you know, other than be real, st really strategic about our audience is to use storytelling. We are a storytelling species. We love narratives. We love stories. And research has shown that stories stick in our minds much better than facts for most people right? For those of us who are little fact collectors, yeah, I, I can remember the, you know, individual facts really well. Maybe you can too. Chances are you didn't get this far in your education if you weren't at least, you know, somewhat competent at assimilating, you know, basic information. Um, but for most people, and, and I will, and I will bet that you've had this experience, stories will stick in your mind better. How many times have you tried to tell a story where you're like, oh, I can't remember the details, but this is the action, right? This cool thing happened and this cool thing happened. I don't remember the guy's name and I don't know the, the name of the species or whatever, but it was this really cool thing. And this would be a much better story if I could actually remember the details, but it's a great, you know, it was a great event, right? The action is what you remember. And, you know, that's, that's just because that's, you know, largely the way our brains are wired to an extent, you know, we have thousands and thousands of, of years of our socialization and our, our human evolution that have resulted in us being a largely social cooperative and, um, uh, you know, storytelling species. So we, we should leverage that. That's a power. That's a tool that we have in our toolkit. All right, so how can we do better, right? How can we ditch this deficit model? Especially if our research looks like this, um, that there are ways that you can be an effective storyteller and use these kinds of tools uh, to tell compelling stories to your audiences by ditching the deficit model, um, ditching this, this sort of reliance on facts. Um, facts and details are great for your um, your uh, your comps, they're great for your defense. Um, you know, they may be important in a job interview, but for your science communication, this is where you're going to want to lean into the storytelling instead. Not fiction necessarily. We're not making things up, right? We're being creative, um, but storytelling is not the same thing as fiction. But we have to get comfortable with letting go of some of the specificity that we've spent the last years and decades even being trained to embrace because it does not serve us well as science communicators. All right, so your first step, as I said, is to strategize. Who are you talking to? You might have control over that, you might not. Um, and then what are your intended outcomes? Uh, that's tied to your goals, right? Why are you communicating your science? Um, so think really carefully. When, when people come to me interested in science communication, they almost always start with step three, right? Down here with these tools. Like, how do I use social media better? How do I grow my audience? How do I start a podcast? How do I do this? Um, and I tell people that the tools are the last thing you need to be thinking about. The first thing you need to think about is who's your audience and what are your goals? What do you want them? What do you want to accomplish? Um, is it sparking joy? Is it changing behaviors? Is it, um, you know, helping people be healthier? You know, whatever it is, you have to think about that first. And then you craft a story that helps you achieve those goals, right? You, you create a message um, that's embedded using these tools of narrative. Um, and then you start to worry about the, the actual tools like, you know, is this gonna be a podcast? Is this going to be a, um, you know, should I, should I get on Instagram or TikTok? And the reason I tell people to wait and think about tools later is not just because you're not gonna be effective if you haven't done steps one and two, but also step three is largely determined by step one. If you wanna to talk to kids, they're not going to be on Instagram. They're not going to be on Twitter or Facebook. They're going to be on YouTube, right? And so um, if your goal is to create a, an outreach program for children, you're going to wanna to be where the children are, whether that's in the classroom or on YouTube. Um, if your goal is to reach forestry managers, you know they might not necessarily be on Instagram, but maybe they would listen to a podcast uh, or a radio show um, you know, while they're driving long distances on rural back roads in Maine, right? So think about who's your audience 
and the end your message and then worry about the tools because that's all going to follow from steps one and two. We're going to focus mostly on step two, although I am going to have you do a little bit of work on step one as well. All right, so uh, if you try to Google what are the components of a story, you will find many, 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 many pages um, that are anything from there are five essential components to a story to 11 essential components to a story and everything in between. Um, fortunately, I'm married to a writer and publisher of fiction. And so uh, so I just asked him, I was like, all right, um, I, I, I'm giving this presentation. I, I can't find a, like a, co a cohesive uh, number of elements to a good story. What do you recommend? And he actually told me to, to use Dan Harmon's components of a, of a story. Um, and so, so he's the writer, creator of Community, um, as, as well as several other projects. Um, so you may be familiar with those. And uh, I actually think this is a really useful um, framework. And Dan Harmon even talks about how uh, this comes directly out of sort of the, the, the mythology literature, right? The hero's journey, Joseph Campbell, they talk about this sort of, you know, for thousands of years, good stories have had these components or these elements. Um, but I will say, and you'll, you'll find this in the literature, this is something that my husband told me as well, that not all good stories have to have these elements. It's okay to break the rules. And sometimes really good stories do break those rules. But if you're trying to craft a story for the first time, it's okay to use some of these universal elements, these arcs that we are we just experience throughout our lives. And if you try to apply this story wheel to most anything from a sitcom episode to a novel, you will probably be able to pick up on most of them. So we start in, in position one, the reader is in a zone of comfort, right? We start from someplace. If you imagine, you know, Bilbo Baggins is, is hanging out in his comfortable little hobbit hole um, and he's happy and content. Um, but then they want something or some, maybe someone wants something of them. They might not necessarily have a choice. Um, then they enter in an unfamiliar situation, right? So there's something that launches the action and then there's some discomfort. Um, they adapt to that discomfort um, in one way or another. Ultimately, they get what they want but there's usually a price. There's a lesson or some loss or, um, or you're sort of, you know, there's something that has to be given up. And then they come back. There's often this return right at the end. Um, and, but you as a person are changed, right? And so that sort of cycle can start again, but uh, you know, that, that position that you return to is not where you started, right? And so there's always some action, you know, there's a character, there's some action, there's some tension, there's a puzzle or a mystery or something that, you know, that sets you off. And then you, you learn things along the way, there are challenges, and then at the end, you are changed. And I would actually argue that this is pretty much the PhD process, right? So you start off in your zone of comfort, having come out of your bachelor's or your master's, you feel really comfortable, you go into graduate school, you want something, you want this PhD, you enter this unfamiliar situation, you adapt, ultimately you get what you want, but you've paid a very heavy price. And then you maybe come back to your family or your community uh, having changed, right? And no one really understands you anymore because if they have not gone through this journey with you, um, then you know then this is a challenge, right? So you, you you're experiencing the hero's journey during the course of your PhD. There there is a there is a price that we pay, right? Um, but you have gained something at the end, hopefully. Um, but so you know think about these elements, right? There's characters, there's action, there's tension, there's puzzles or problems, um, there's resolution, there are lessons, you know. Those are the elements of a good story and you can take those with you when you craft your stories about your research. All right, just checking my time here. Okay, um, so I'm gonna share some examples of uh, what these might look like um, by sharing some of the research that I do um, and then, tr and I'm actually not gonna tell you much about the research at all, uh, but I'll talk about ways that I've sort of taken these more cold, or impersonal or just technical aspects of the science that we do, um, which is the familiar language that you and I share with each other, but that's not something that we necessarily share with the community. So how do you take that information and then hopefully translate that into a story that inspires or uh, is, is enjoyable or is a call to action or educates or something like that. Um, and I tried to focus on some uh, more sort of uh, eco-informatics-esque examples to hopefully be more approachable and relatable. Um, since as a, I, I have a mix of, you know, um, modeling and uh, field-based projects, um, so I, but I wanted, you know, to hopefully uh, 
share some examples that would be more relatable to you because I thought about my audience, right? All right, so for this first one, this, um, we actually have an ongoing project that's just wrapping up now uh, where we're, we're looking at uh, 60,000 years of small mammal and plant fossil and, and uh, mega herbivore fossil data. And we're using those co-occurrences within the fossil record to build Bayesian food web models um, from these different Pleistocene communities. And our goal is by looking at the structure um, of those food webs uh, to be able to then model or predict species extinction risk and resilience. So we, the, the goal here is to use these sort of known community dynamics from the past and then use those to make some kind of predictions about extinction sensitivity um, tested against what actually happened, right? So we know what species ultimately went extinct from these communities um, or were locally extirpated. We can build our, our food web models and test them accordingly. And once we know they work, Ideally, we'll be able to apply them to systems that are you know, happening today um, so that we can identify species that are most vulnerable or at risk uh, to climate change or, uh, or, 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 or hunting or, um, or habitat loss or things like that. Um, and so this is sort of a nice workflow diagram that shows that for any given time step, we have these you know, interaction networks. Uh, they're sort of ensembles of, of many food webs using this Bayesian approach. So this is not accessible, right? People get the concept of food webs, most of them do. Um, it's something that they sort of associate with maybe elementary school, um, but it's, you know, this sort of framework and this figure, it's very technical, it's hard to wrap your brain around. So instead, I'm gonna turn this into a story. All right. Why do some, ex some animals go extinct while others survive? We have this bison as this icon of the last ice age um, where we have bison today, the plains of South Dakota once also supported giant ground sloths and mammoths and mastodons and horses and camels and so many other iconic Ice Age species that you know we think of in our minds when we picture the Ice Age but are no longer present. They've been extinct for over 10,000 years. So why is that? Why you know why did we lose some of these large animals but but others like the bison survived? So I went to uh, South Dakota um, to try and uh, use the fossil record as a way to help shed some light on this mystery because we have this near miss of extinction of bison, um, but we know that they survived the extinctions 12,000 years ago. So how can we use this information to help bison survive into the future? So we went to this place called Persistence Cave, um, which is a cave in um, Wind Cave National Park. Um, I didn't go down into the cave, um, as, but we did have a, a team of, of folks who went down into the cave and they pulled out um, just buckets and buckets of soil from the cave. And the soil was completely full of fossils. Um, uh, we think it was used as a den by wolves and maybe later coyotes that were bringing in all of the, the things that they were eating on the landscape and they would bring it into the cave and then they would eat it um, and they're scattering the bones of those of those animals around. So we're basically taking advantage of this, you know, uh, pantry for these ancient Ice Age wolves. Uh, and so we would take those buckets of, uh, of soil out of the cave, and this was my job. Um, I would sit here and I would screen those fossils through, um, this is the before picture, this got really muddy, um, into these big tanks. And you know, as we're sitting there doing this work, all these bison are walking by. Um, it was a really magical place to work. Um, it got a little intimidating at times, but um, it was a, you know, our job up on top was to take the, the buckets of soil, as I said, and sort them out and find all of these tiny little fragments. The, the really big bones were easy to see and pull apart. Um, but what we would do is once you screen through, it's sort of like panning for gold. You can see there's tons of little bits of gravel, little fragments of plants, um, and hidden among here are tiny, tiny little bones of the smallest mammals. So if you imagine how small a mouse is, imagine how small a mouse's knuckle bone would be, right? So we're using magnifying lenses and tiny tweezers to pull apart all of these tiny little, you know, snake vertebrae and squirrel um, toe bones and these the tiniest little bones you can imagine. They were so adorable. And um, I usually work with plants. And so this was really, really fun for me. Um, I had a really good time just sitting here focusing. I could have done this for hours. I love puzzles, um, just you know, playing with and, and sorting out these little bones, um, putting them into tiny little vials so that we could identify them later. And over the course of several days, um, some mysterious things started to happen. Um, we came into our field site one morning 
And uh, I had this 50 meter long tape, this measuring tape that we would use to measure things like distance or depth. Um, and it had been completely unraveled and cut into little sort of eight inch sections and was, was brought down into the cave and in a big pile. And that was really strange. Uh, and then when I went to go get my water bottle, um, like my trusty Nalgene here, something had chewed through the strap attaching the lid to the bottle. And that, that was a little bit obnoxious, but that's fine. Uh, so I came back from a day at the field site and took off my you know, rattlesnake proof boots and went to go put my chacos on um, so that my feet could breathe and something had chewed through all of the, strap, the straps on my shoes. And then I went to go and pick up my backpack um, to get my field notebook out um, and found that something had chewed holes in the bottom of my backpack uh, and so that it would no longer hold uh, any of my stuff. And then I went to go get my backup hiking boots and uh, found that something had chewed through all of the seams along the toes so that the, the basically the boots were completely falling apart. And so hundreds of, in one, like one day, basically hundreds of dollars worth of my field gear had been completely destroyed by these guys. So small mammals, little rodents um, and, uh, you know, squirrels and other things that uh, were taking advantage of this incredibly cool, wet spring and early summer. There was a huge population boom happening at the time. And me, uh, not coming from a place where this is a huge problem, had foolishly left all of my stuff out. And while I'm sitting here focusing on all these tiny little fossils all around me, literally like within feet of me, all of these, these animals are coming out of the woodwork and chewing on everything I own. And, and it, it occurred to me in this moment when I was kind of taking a tally of everything that was happening and piecing together the story from all this evidence, that this was like these small animals that were like, hey, look at us, we are still here. You're focused on all of these ancient extinct species. Um, you know, you're, you're looking at the toe bones of our great, 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 great grand squirrels and we are still right here. Um, sure, woolly mammoths are cool, but look at us. We are part of the Ice Age Survivors Club. Right? And it was this moment where it, it, it really profoundly changed how I think about these, these Ice Age communities because I'm so used to focusing on extinction. I work on the consequences of the extinction of things like woolly mammoths, right? What do we lose from a landscape when we lose the last mammoth? And then I had spent so much time thinking on, about what we had lost that I was completely ignoring all of the things um, that have survived, right? And the things that that have, have made it through those extinction events and have been incredibly resilient, right? And so understanding how these survivors have persisted despite you know, these incredible environmental changes um, is giving me new insights in, in terms of you know, how can we help all of the species that you, know, you can look outside your window and see, they're all Ice Age survivors, right? What can they tell us about the ability of, of biodiversity to survive uh, this period of, of incredible global change that we're entering right now, right? So, so that was a story about food webs uh, and uh, extinction risk and persistence. And I never said the word food web. I never showed a food web model. Um, and in fact, um, I, I, yeah, I, uh, I don't think I ever actually talked about um, any kind of actual data or showed any figures or facts or statistics at all, right? So that's one example. All right, so, oh, and another, another thing I could say is, um, you know, you could also make an argument here for, depending on your message, um, you know, there's another hidden story here about the, the persistence uh, of the people that we have historically been ignoring and forgetting about or erasing their, their contributions to science, right? So, um, you know, the incredible women and uh, people, other people of color who have been, you know, here in these spaces, in these scientific spaces, often doing this work invisibly, silently from the sidelines or being sidelined, um, left out of the Nobel Prize, things like that. Um, you know, so there's another potential metaphor here that you could use. Um, um, and you know it's a it's a very human one, right? So this idea of persistence and resilience uh, in the face of uh, you know people sort of chasing down the big flashy dramatic things. All right, so here's a second example. I'm just gonna check my time. Okay, good. Um, I also do a lot of work on extinction consequences and trophic cascades. So the data that we might generate might look something like this. This is pollen data from Silver Lake in Ohio, showing uh, it's an NMDS um, showing <clears throat> changes in the ecological community. Uh, as we go from familiar 
uh, ecosystems to uh, immediately following extinctions, we go into a period of high uh, dissimilarity from present vegetation. Um, so there's a sort of 2000 year period of upheaval and then vegetation changes and resembles something kind of close to modern. Um, this is not a very accessible figure. Um, and you know, I can tell a good story with it to a scientific audience. Um, I, I feel very confident about that, but it's not something that I would take and try to uh, share or explain to, um, to a, a non-scientific audience, right? Uh, first of all, this is a figure about megafaunal extinction impacts on vegetation and you know the mammoth is completely buried, right? There's there, there's the, the really exciting and charismatic parts of the story are completely missing. And you know, we can look at this and say something about you know community similarity in a plant community, but you don't even know what plant community you're looking at, right? And so that's not relatable to most people. I could tell you that we go from a boreal ecosystem or boreal parkland ecosystem here to something that's like a mixed no analog woodland uh, to a, an oak savanna, and that that's informative to most of you, but it's not going to be necessarily informative to you know the people that are just down the street from me, right? And so you know, here's another story that I can I can tell that that says some of the same things that this one does. All right. So um, I, uh, a couple of years ago, I went to um, the uh, Balaygara River or the Indigurka River region of, of Siberia uh, to film a documentary about the incredible preservative powers of the Ice Age permafrost. Um, so here is me, uh, you know, in my first time north of the Arctic Circle. Um, we had our trusty uh, lab mascot, um, Mags, uh, who's actually named for Margaret Davis. Um, so she comes with us in, into the field. Um, and uh, it was this incredible place. Um, and I'd never, like I said, I'd never been to Russia or Siberia. I'd never been north of the Arctic Circle before. And so we were going down into these permafrost tunnels that people had been um, creating because they're, they're actually there searching for these, um, uh, the, the, these fossil ivory tusks from ancient elephants, um, woolly mammoths, and also uh, woolly rhino horns. Um, so this is a, a market that's cropped up as there's been a, a lockdown in the global ivory trade, but there's still a demand for ivory. So people have, uh, the local peoples of this region have actually turned to looking for fossil ivory to meet that global market. And this is really uncomfortable for me as a scientist, um, but at the same time, because they've been drilling, you know, using hydro mining to get into the, the permafrost deposits, they're also finding these other incredible ice age specimens. And that's why, that's why we were there. Um, and so there's this, it's this really interesting situation where it's really uncomfortable for me, but then you have this, this whole exposure to all of these new ice age specimens. And um, because the permafrost is so incredible at preserving them, we have access to information about the past that we have never had before. Um, and so it was a really kind of weird experience to be there for this reason that was kind of uncomfortable, but also um, to have this unprecedented opportunity to, to really see the past in ways that, you know, I have not been able to before. And so I just want to show you a really quick video of uh, this is an example of the hydro mining that they're doing. So that was incredibly uncomfortable for me as a scientist because, you know, I'm used to going out and, and doing, you know, when we when we excavate these fossils, we have very precise methods. Um, we take all of that soil that's around the, the bones and we sieve it for, you know, small fragments of, you know, tiny little animals or plants or even potentially human artifacts that might be present. Meanwhile, this is all just sort of being blasted, um, you know, out of the, the bank of a, of a river um, or sort of tunneled underneath. Um, so here they were actually trying to excavate um, this, uh, you know, we've been told that there was this incredibly well-preserved woolly mammoth um, that, you know, was was coming out of the permafrost. And I, I have worked on these animals my entire life or my, my entire career. Um, I have focused my research on the impacts of the extinction of these animals. And the hard thing about being an ice age ecologist is that I never get to see my study systems, right? We don't have a time machine or a TARDIS. I can't, you know, I'm not like my friends who are out there right now trapping flying squirrels. I can't just go out there and you know, with some binoculars and and, and or um, you know, go to an enclosure and see the animals that I study up close. They have been extinct for thousands of years, so I can only ever see them in my mind's eye. I might be able to pull out a drawer and look at a tooth or look at a bone, 
But I was really excited to come out to this place because I was told that, you know, there, there were rumors that we might see things that were, you know, unlike anything we'd seen before. And so when we arrived, uh, we got to this place and I, I climbed up over this hill and I immediately saw something that I think changed that changed in that moment changed my life. And I, um, I actually didn't even get a picture of it because I started crying. Um, and it was this foot. It was a perfectly preserved woolly mammoth foot that was just sitting just on a stump and it had toes and it had, you know, it was the foot pad. It was everything. It was like roughly this big. And in that moment, woolly mammoths became real for me. I had, I had spent my career studying them and their impacts on ecosystems, but they were just another data point in a lot of ways. And in that moment, I realized it's not just a data point. Um, a bone in a museum is not just a specimen. This was an individual. And this was an individual who, uh, you know, had a beating heart and moved around in the landscape, uh, cared for its fellow, the, the, the other members of its herd, um, you know, was part of a community, was part of a family, um, shared information, passed that information down from generation to generation. And so I got down into the pit and uh, those of you who might have figured this out already, what you're looking at is actually a, a woolly mammoth leg from the knee down. Um, and so what we realized was that Everything from the knee down in this in this individual was was really well preserved. There's you can see there's skin, there's tendons, you can see the fur, you can see the bottom of the foot, there's the toes. Um, so it's not just bone, but it's also flesh and muscle and tendons and skin and fat. Um, and everything from the knee up was completely picked clean. You can see just the bit of the um, the thigh bone up here. And what we realized was that. What probably happened was, you know, just like us, we'd been walking around this, this muddy landscape, like I showed you, you know, getting stuck up to our waist at, at times. Um, this was a really dangerous place to be for these animals. If you step in the wrong place, you know, you could get stuck um, and you wouldn't have five other friends to kind of pull you out. Um, and so what probably happened is this individual would have gotten stuck and then probably got scared and was thrashing around and just got itself stuck even more and then eventually died and was uh, you know, maybe starved to death or maybe was killed by predators. Um, and then scavengers came and picked it clean from the knee up. And, and it was just this sort of moment of realizing the information that we have about that individual's last moments that made me realize that, you know, again, this, it's not just a specimen. Um, you know, it, it's a, it was an animal, a living, breathing animal that, you know, its chest would have, would have expanded and then, and then exhaled as it breathed and its eyes would have shown fear. It would have known, you know, about its own demise as, as, it, as the end came near, you know, an awareness of its own impending death. And I just had this realization that even though these animals have been dead for thousands of years, they're very much alive, right? They are more than just specimens. And I have a duty as a scientist to do right by them, to tell their story and to, you know, help us appreciate and understand what we lose when we lose these animals, right? It's not just um, an ecosystem service, right? It's not just a component of a community um, that, you know, these, these, are, these animals are gone and they're never coming back. Um, but their information, you know, the, 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 the gift of the, that they give us through their remains, you know, can help us not just to understand their own ecology, um, but also might help us understand, you know, how we can protect, you know, the thawing permafrost today. Um, hopefully you can uh, hear this. Uh, this is the sound of climate change. You can hear the dripping plop. So this is, you know, thawing permafrost. That's carbon that's been captured for thousands of years being released. Um, as you know, our actions are warming the planet and not only making these kinds of, of you know, specimens you know, pop out more often, um, but you know, we have real concerns about what this is going to do for, for our planet. And so understanding the role that these, these large animals had in their ecosystems, you know, it's too late for us to save them, but it might not be too late for us to save you know, the survivors like the muskox. And so this information, you know, that they give us in their very bones and their flesh, um, you know, th those sort of records of their last moments and the last meals that they ate, um, you know, will be really important and, you know, could, could save the world, right? It could help us to, to understand how to keep, um, 
the, the tundra resilient to climate change, how to keep carbon you know, in the permafrost. Um, and so that's, some of the, that's motivating a lot of the work that we're doing now uh, in our lab. So, so here I take a, you know, a, a concept right, of, of plant vegetation interactions. And instead of you know, using sort of quantitative approaches to, uh, to sort of shape or frame our understanding of what those trophic cascades might look like, you know, I take a moment, an individual, uh, a moment that changed my life um, and, you know, make you feel empathy, hopefully, for this individual um, mammoth um, to, to help you realize sort of what's at stake, sort of blowing it out to this global scale. I mean, I'm obviously rushing through these examples, but hopefully you're kind of getting some of the ideas about how the framing is working. All right, so last example, Ooh, running out of time. Um, I'll, go, I'll go quickly through this one. Um, so we, uh, one of my PhD students recently had a paper that came out where he used this range filling approach to look at the range dynamics and, uh, uh, and, and climatic niches of 447 species of North American trees. So the idea was to figure out whether or not um, species are in equilibrium with climate. Um, and so we looked at both realized and then a simulated set of ranges as a null model uh, to try to figure out um, just what to what degree trees are in equilibrium with climate. And you can see uh, on average, uh, we have about 50% range filling. So widely um, across North America, uh, trees are not growing in all the places that are climatically suitable for them. And so how, how do you tell that story? Because um, you don't have a woolly mammoth to, uh, as a character. So, so, here, so, so here's, here's you know, my best approach. Here's what I got. Um, so there is in the southeastern US in a small region of northern Florida and southern Georgia, a, a, basically a, a, a walking ghost. Um, it's known as the stinking cedar or Florida toria, toria taxifolia. Uh, we know that it was widespread 10 to 12,000 years ago across the Eastern US. Um, and now it is restricted to just a few places, just a few remaining individuals. It's one of the most endangered trees that we have in the entire world. And nobody knows what, you know, what its story is. Nobody knows why it's, it's in a, in, in, uh, being threatened by extinction. Um, and so we know that even though it grows in these warmer, more humid climates, if you transplant it, it can actually grow quite well in places. So this is its natural range. It can actually grow, grow quite well in places um, like Cincinnati, Ohio, where this is uh, one that was planted uh, decades ago in an arboretum. And so we know that it tends to prefer growing in cooler places further north, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles from where it's grown today. Um, but we don't know why it's restricted to this really narrow range where it just does not do very well. And there might be an answer in terms of uh, its cones. So these, these look like fruits, but they're actually cones because this is a conifer, right? Um, so these are the female cones and it, it makes these big sort of fleshy, almost fruit-like cones, female cones where the seeds are. Um, and some people have speculated that perhaps uh, these long extinct giant tortoises that also once used to roam the you know eastern part of what is now the United States might have eaten these. Um, they might have co-evolved tens of millions of years ago um, and those giant tortoises are, are have been extinct for for 10,000 years and perhaps without its ancient dispersers around these trees are struggling. Um, we also know that um, you know it's being hammered by invasive diseases that have been introduced more recently but you know but even prior to that this tree was not doing well right it was it was having a hard time so it's this big it's this big mystery it's a, it's a big puzzle as to what happened to restrict the ranges of these trees so severely um and you know but fortunately there are um a group of people who are known as the Toria Guardians, um, and they are working to try to transplant this tree, to act actively move it outside of its current range into the places that might be more climatically suitable. And this tree is just one example of many trees that are, are having similar problems. We're just not finding them in the places that they should be growing or that they could grow um, if we were to move them there. And if you were to pick up something like the trees of North America, just choose, choose any field guide to trees that you might have. Um, you know, on average, any tree in that field guide 
is only found in about half of its potential range, right? The places, only about half of the places that that tree could grow are we actually finding it. We don't really understand why that is. Maybe there are other factors that are really important for being a tree that we're just not measuring on the ground, like things it requires in its soil. Um, but what we do know is that regardless, the climate is changing and it's changing really rapidly, much more rapidly than it changed when Toria, Florida Toria, or the stinking cedar got left behind in, you know, southern Georgia thousands of years ago. And so that means we might need to be more active. We might need to, to, to intervene if we want these species to persist and to not go extinct. And so there are people who are doing what's called uh, assisted migration or managed relocation, where they're actively helping helping out, basically helping these trees sort of hitchhike to the places that they need to get. Um, and these kinds of conservation efforts are, are controversial, um, but they're, we are increasingly turning to them because of the challenges of climate change. They require us to be more creative and to think outside the box. All right, so that's, that's an example where I took sort of one iconic member um, of, of a tree that um, you know, is, is, is severely restricted in, term, in terms of its potential range. It has extremely low range filling um, and it has a, a compelling story. And I sort of highlighted that and used that as an entree into the general problem. Um, so uh, I used a few tools with these, these vignettes that I shared with you. And I just wanna highlight some of the deliberate choices that I made um, in, in sharing those, those vignettes. One is I focused on characters, right? Sometimes the character was a tree. Sometimes it was a, a dead mammoth. Um, sometimes it was me, right? Um, but there, there should be a character and that character should be compelling in some way, should be interesting. Um, so you can be the character, you know, maybe it's your journey, maybe it's your, you trying to figure out a puzzle. Um, maybe you can pick up an example, you know, from that community that you think is, you want to highlight and focus on. Um, you know, if you're, if you're working with all 447 trees in North America, you don't have to tell all of their stories, right? You can just pick one. Um, I, I used a lot of puzzles and mysteries, right? People love mysteries and puzzles. Um, it's a great hook to get people thinking. As soon as you pose a question to people, their, their mind starts spinning. It's a great way to invite people in. Um, I use analogy and metaphor, right? I would not say uh, during the end of the last glacial period, um, over 50% of mammals with an adult body size larger than 50 kilograms when extinct. 50 kilograms is not accessible to people. So what I would say instead would be something like, um, at the end of the last ice age, over half of the animals larger than an adult German shepherd went extinct, right? So just find a good analogy or a good metaphor or like using the, um, the tree guide, right? Like 447 trees, what does that even mean? Well, pick up, your, pick up your favorite guide to the trees of North America. Now like rip it in half, right? That's, that's, that's a better metaphor. Uh, I used what I'm calling modular, modular elements, meaning I didn't always tell the story that fit the data um, or, well, the story fit the data, but it didn't derive from the data, right? So the food web work that we're doing is actually at the La Brea Tar Pits and we don't have the results yet. So I can't really tell you a compelling story from that data because we're still, we're just wrapping that project up. But I did have a story that was similar um, that, you know, in, in a different place related to a different project um, that ultimately never ended up going anywhere. But um, there was sort of a moment where I could bring you into the field with me and tell stories with similar themes, right? So you can pull different pieces from different components of your work and craft a story around that. People don't need to know that the, the bone that you're showing is not the bone that you measured, right? They don't need to, to know that the picture of the tree that you're looking at might not have been one that you actually analyzed. Um, that's not, you're not lying to people. What you're doing is you're telling an effective story because the themes and the ideas might be more important in terms of your ultimate goals and your outcomes. All right, I used mostly images. I didn't use graphs. Um, I didn't, uh, you know, there are times and places where you can use graphs to great effect. Um, you know, for example, uh, the famous forklift scene in An Inconvenient Truth where Al Gore is getting lifted up to show you just how much CO2 has, or temperatures on CO2 have risen uh, in the historic period, that's an effective visual. So you can use data effectively. Um, it just wasn't something that I chose to do in this presentation. Um, I, because for one, it's hard enough for us as scientists to follow along with words and pictures and what someone's saying at the same time, right? Um, and so the, the less 
heavy lifting you could ask people to do, the more they can get caught up in your story. Um, I was very selective. Um, like I said, um, I didn't tell you every single story of all 447 North American trees, right? I was very careful to pick one that that um, could I could tell a compelling story around. And that's hard for us. Uh, as scientists, we wanted to tell we want to show all, all of our work, right? We want to tell you all the things we did. Um, there were many components of that range filling story that I did not get into, like a bunch of really cool results about range dynamics and what controls them at the continental scale. Um, not important to my story, right? Not important to the goals that I had for, for telling that vignette. Uh, and I told stories that resonated with me, right? You should enjoy the story you're telling or you're not gonna be an effective storyteller. So you might feel compelled to craft a message because that's what's popular. Um, this is some, something else I've learned from my husband, the fiction writer, right? Uh, there's often this idea that, oh, I've, this is a really hot topic right now, or this is a hot theme. I should be, I should be focusing you know, along those lines. But if your heart is not in it, then you're not going to be an effective storyteller. And so I urge you to think about or find the hooks that you get excited by, right? Um, that is going to help you craft a better story than the one you think people should hear. And sometimes you are motivated or you don't have a lot of choices um, and you, you, you know, there is a, a central message that people should hear, but you do have some flexibility in how you get there. Um, and so don't be too anxious about what you think is a, 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 like a, will be a popular story. Find your voice, find your, embrace your weirdness, embrace your unique, you know, uh, angle that you have and people will listen, they will follow you. All right, so, okay. We're really short on time. Um, I had I had wanted us to I'd wanted us to spend some time in small groups figuring out your audience and then kind of reporting back. Um, and then my second uh, second goal was to um, figure out uh, what your story was from that data. But we have twenty minutes left, and so I think I might instead uh, just leave this up here for you to sort of scribble some notes and I can share my slides with you. Um, and that way we have time for questions at the end because I think that that's really important. Um, and so, you know, as you're going through this yourself, again, figure out your audience and importantly, don't expect one interaction to accomplish your goals. You're not gonna necessarily change people's minds or, um, or even be good at this the first time you try it and that's okay. Um, you're committing to this process for the long haul. So ask yourself, what's the central problem or challenge? Think about who your audience is for this particular effort um, and then what your intended outcome is. And also remember that it's okay if fun is the intended outcome. It, not everything has to have a, a deeper, broader meaning um, or fun can be one of many outcomes. It doesn't have to just be one. You know, Maybe you want people to learn something and enjoy it, hopefully. Um, and then you know, once you have that, spend some time thinking about Okay, well, what's the angle? What's the story? You know, you've you've all got multiple chapters of your dissertations. Each one of those is already a story. You have already been deciding to some extent um, as you package these for a proposal defense or as you turn these into publishable units, those are narratives. You've already realized through the course of your training that any data set you have, any study that you have, you know you can interpret it in, an, in a number of different ways um, that are all still true to the data, but the framing might be changing, right? If you have a data set that tells you something about, um, you know, I, I, this is something I tell my students all the time. Um, if you have a data set that, that, that tells you something about, um, like I have a, a recently graduated PhD student who found uh, evidence that um, climate change in the Southern Ocean, and that drove population shifts in or, or distribution shifts in seabirds, which caused a, a trophic cascade where marine derived nutrients caused plants to grow on land, right? Okay, well, there's a bunch of different angles you could take to that. Um, one angle might be, um, you know, the, the fact that these seabirds weren't present during a warm period in the past means we don't know where these seabirds are going to go in the future. So there's a, a climate change angle. Maybe you lean into the, um, uh, the trophic cascade literature and you want to hit this hard from more of a sort of fundamental ecological uh, theory and um, uh, kind of framework. Maybe you want to talk more about the restoration angle, right? The, 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 the vegetation types that thrive with these seabirds are also threatened. And so, you know, if we want to restore them effectively, we need to focus on, you know, making sure seabirds are, 
you know, allowed into the places or we're using some sort of analog for seabird guano, right? So there's a whole bunch of different stories that you could choose to focus on um, for any given chapter you have. So you're already actually doing this. It just, it's just what you're doing is you're telling stories for a scientific audience. And that's something we're trained to think about. Now you just have to start using the same tools that you've already learned and apply those to a broader general audience. Um, and that general audience, I would encourage you uh, to try to be more specific if you can, right? To try to find an audience that, you know, if, if you just wanna do this work for the fun of it, try to find an audience that you think you will resonate with, that you have, you know, that, that you have those strong empathy connections or those bridges already built because of, you, you know, the, the groups and the things that you share together in a Venn diagram of your lives. Um, but sometimes you're gonna to have to talk to people who might be hostile, or maybe you have to talk to Congress or lawmakers or um, you know, fund, a funding agency or something like that. And so you know, where you have less control, then you have to do a little bit more heavy lifting to figure out what those empathy connections are. Um, but but I, would, I would I actually really believe that you're doing a lot of this already. You're just thinking about it in a different way. And so it's just a matter of repackaging the kinds of things, the tools you're already using and um, applying those to a different, a different audience. All right, so with that, I think, well, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. So I'm gonna stop there because I find questions to be really valuable. So uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna turn it over to all of you now and hopefully we can, uh, I'm sorry we didn't get to an actual workshop element, but feel free to do this on your own time. Uh, that was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Gill. And I'll just be helping to facilitate the Q&A as well. So I'll be, you know, looking at the chat and can read off some of the questions. Um, but if, you know, anybody has questions, feel free to unmute yourself, obviously, and, and ask as well. Um, but while we're waiting for questions to come in, I do have um, a couple of my own. Um, so I guess when thinking about, you know, communicating to these scientific audiences, and I just was wondering, how do you adapt your presentations when you're going to, you know, scientific conferences where you really do have to get into the meat of the analyses that you did or whatever models you used? And how do you kind of communicate that on an exciting and relatable kind of plane? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know if any of you noticed that I struggled actually in this presentation to kind of um, switch between modes, right? To, to go from, I am in, accessible general communication mode and shoot now I have a graph and I have to like communicate that really briefly and effectively but using some of the scientific jargon that's actually a good shorthand that helps us understand things right um and so I would say that it's it takes practice but once you start doing one or once you start doing both um you'll notice that it might it might take you a little bit to sort of swap between those two modes um especially if you're writing a lot, if you're writing for a general audience, kind of shifting back into technical writing is, is harder. But I would say that some of the same tools that make effective communication for a broad audience also really are effective for technical audiences. Because, I mean, how many of us have been to talks where we've seen, um, We've seen, uh, we've seen people talking within our own field and we don't understand what they're saying. That's not our deficiency necessarily, right? Um, it's, it's not just because we're not good at science. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with being accessible to our peers either. And so I will use similar tools. Um, for example, uh, let's see, I'm gonna pull, um, see if I have this PowerPoint presentation I can share really quickly. Um, just to kind of show show by doing um, some of the, the techniques that I use um, for even a scientific audience. Again, use the jargon, but don't leave people behind. And so, all right, so for example, here's that NMDS that I was showing you. And, um, you know, you can see that I've got some color coding here on my axes to help people remember that we're going from closed to open forests, we're going from deciduous to boreal, right? So that way I don't just tell you like negative access to scores is blah, 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 blah. You know, people aren't gonna remember that. I always have take home messages at the top of my slides so that if you get completely lost, um, you know, you can see something, you know, you can at least like hold on to that. Um, and then I'll do things like, like in this case, I actually simplified my diagrams. I wanted to show a whole bunch of sites overlaying on each other. And so I just used a bunch of colored ellipses and I walked through what that meant using cartoons, right? So I, I kind of revisited the same data and broke, broke each one down. And it's like, okay, 
we go from mammoths to no mammoths, right? And so instead of just saying that, I have a visual. Um, and then I have, you know, some other visuals that I use to kind of explain the, the between site differences. And then, you know, so there's there's like different elements that you can use graphically as well as verbally that will do the same kinds of heavy lifting for you, for your peers. Maybe they're, they're just implemented differently. Um, my postdoc, my former postdoc, Caitlin, just uh, had a paper come out where she was able to use, and it was an, a, a plot she made in R of plant community change, but she used little plant emojis. And it was just a more compelling figure, but it also actually told a better story than if they had been tiny little symbols. You could actually see what was going on in the figure better. Um, and so don't be afraid to use some of the same tools that are effective in you know, public communication with your peers, because chances are, you know, actually they've, they've even done, there have been some empirical studies that show that um, papers that are written more broadly get cited more, right? There is no reason, there's no really good reason other than machismo to like try to beat people over the head with really inaccessible research. Um, so yeah, so I would say like, there's just, Go for it. Do it. Do it with your peers, just as you do. You know, with. Um, I mean, obviously, they're not going to be exactly the same, but you can use a lot of the same elements, and people will enjoy your talks more. Yeah, and that's feedback that I get from people. Yeah, I completely agree. Your your talk was it was, you know, just paying attention the entire time, and it was it was really great. I loved all the, the images, and I think everybody else did as well. There were some great comments in the chat throughout as well. If you want to take back, take a look. Yeah, you inspired one of our next kind of seminar workshops for following, sem following semester, um, how to take good field pictures, <laughs> right? So if we can get somebody to kind of teach us to do that too, because I found that your, you know, your use of images and stuff has really helps to get the story across too. Like you said, replacing those, replacing graphics and complicated data with images photos yeah, and the visuals were amazing and, and also the story about the um the muskox hoof i was just so captivating so that was fantastic no oh, thank you yeah i mean you can do that too you don't have to you can yeah you can i think we don't use photos enough um in our and i would challenge you like at some point when you feel comfortable and ready and that's that's going to be really risky for early career people but once you're able to you know try to give a talk with no graphs see how that goes you can do it. You can give a compelling science talk, not science communication, like, but actual research talk with no graphs. I bet you dollars to donuts, you can do it. Yeah, I had a question oh, about, oh, sorry, go for it, please. Um, I was just curious, uh, a lot of the communication stuff uh, isn't really focused on as far as the science curriculum and the uh, stuff that we're learning. And a lot of that's more undergrad or even in high school or, you know, more basic than that. Do you think that there should be more emphasis on the communicative aspects of science put into like grad level courses, for instance? Like just sort of general science communication broadly or? Um, um, more like the actual communicative skills because you've, you've, you, it's, it hasn't been broad with you. You've got these specific things that you have used as tools and they work obviously because we're all just like watching this thing with bated breath. So um, I think that it, do you think that there should be more courses that sort of teach these skills for graduate do. level. Yeah, I definitely do. And you know, a lot of these skills, like any with your graduate skills, you know, you may not be able to get them in classes. There's a lot of these skills that you sort of pick up through workshops or hands-on, um, you know, conferences, things like that. Um, ESA, I did a workshop on improv, um, tools from improv to for effective building empathy actually in science communication. Um, and so take an improv class, do some theater, I will tell you, it will really help. Um, uh, but, you know, there, so there are sort of technical tools, skills you can get too, like videography and filmography um, uh, or photography, but you also don't necessarily have to do all the things, right? I do these things because I enjoy them and they, they invigorate my science. Um, they break up my, they break up long days of filling out forms and you know that I, I just I enjoy it so I feel compelled to do it but I also enjoy it not everyone will and I think there are lots of ways of doing outreach and giving back you know writing a technical extension report counts you know as far as I'm concerned right it doesn't not everyone has to do a podcast nor do we all have time to listen to all the podcasts right um so I would say you know don't feel like you have to do all of the things don't feel that you have to do any one particular thing but if you feel called to or compelled to um 
then I think it's a great idea. And if and and just in terms of general talks, because that's something we'll often be called to do, um, you know. And that's why I focused on on that aspect, the storytelling aspect, because that's something you can take to everything else. Um, if you know, if you do do a podcast or something like that, um, just for our everyday talks, I would say, yeah, definitely. Um, we do exercises in my lab to help build some of these tools. Um, I would love to see more data visualization courses uh, for graduate students, um, not just in terms of how to use ggplot, but like how what makes a good figure. Um, I got some of that through uh, my geography background because, you know, in cartography, design is really important. Um, and so, you know, I, I think about the aesthetics of images, um, but, you know, you can do that in classes and I definitely think we should, but if you're not, if you don't have access to that or you can't pick it up in, in short courses or workshops here and there, um, you know, make a journal club, do, you know, uh, do it together in your, in your lab group or your, you know, your meetings where, all right, we're just going to, uh, we're going to practice our elevator pitches to get today, or we're going to, break down what makes a good figure, or we're going to, uh, you know, when you're practicing your thesis proposal, um, you know, think about bringing in some of those elements into those, those moments and just start to, to practice them, you know, a little bit at a time in the, in the, the, the kinds of presentations we're already doing. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. And that's one of the reasons why I like this informatics program that NAU's got, because it's got that emphasis on you know, all the different stuff that you have to do with informatics. It's not just the quantitative stuff, but it's more of the also visualization and other stuff. So I think uh, that's great to hear because it sounds like kind of similar to what we're doing over here. Yeah, yep. And, and someone just mentioned storytelling. That's There's a huge renaissance in storytelling right now, um, especially with shows like The Moth and Story Collider, which focuses specifically on science. And you can take classes and workshops in storytelling, absolutely. And all of those things I think will will help you be a better science communicator. Not not even just for outreach, but for communicating with other scientists too. Yeah, we actually had a couple of questions in the chat about, you know, what are your favorite resources um, for science communication? Do you have a book that you recommend? Um, and do you teach a class in science communication? If you do, would you be willing to share your syllabus? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, awesome, <it's> Kiona. <laughs> I, wish I, I, I wish I could teach that class. I just don't have room. Um, uh, but I have done some little one-off things like at ESA um, and I've, I've done like one day workshops, things like that. Um, so I have a, I'm going to email a list of um, some papers that I find that are really useful. So I'll, I'll email that to Kiona to share with all of you. Um, one of my favorite, actually one of my favorite books on science communication is actually a book about science writing for scientists, for academic writing. Um, it's Stephen Hurd's The Scientist's Guide to Writing, or A Scientist's Guide to Writing. Um, and it's really excellent just at, you know, improving your general science writing um, for, for writing academic papers. He even has a section at the end on whimsy and fun. Um, and there are some really great books like uh, Don't Be Such a Scientist. Um, and uh, let's see, there, there are things like the, um, uh, the Compass uh, program. I find them less effective because uh, they still kind of emphasize that deficit model, right? It's just a matter of figuring out what your message is and how to get your facts out there. But um, I've actually found things like improv classes and um, storytelling classes to be more effective in general. Um, but uh, yeah, if I, I can, I'll share that. I have a whole list of references that you know we've collected in our lab um, that I can share that you know, back up the things that I found um, and will hopefully be a good reference for reading. Because it's nice to have empirical evidence, right? I mean, we still want that, right? Even if it feels intuitively right or if it feels wrong, actually, we, we still want that, you know, to know that that's, that's real. Yeah, definitely. I know we'd, we would definitely appreciate that. And we had another question from Yvonne in the chat. He says, in your experience of science communication, have you had success in changing attitudes with different audiences? And um, so he was saying that sometimes he thinks that empathy is the key factor when speaking to people with, with maybe possibly no, no formal education. Um, so, so, so the, is the question, sorry, so the, can you that? So the question is, um, let's see, maybe Yvonne, you want to speak up as well? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. In, yes, well, thanks for the, for the speak. I, I would like to see well, to ask you, if, did you notice some changes or different response from different audiences. Mm. So my hypothesis is like, uh, 
you don't, I mean, you, you, you have to move the heart instead of the brains for some people. Since the most, the, the biggest change in the audiences, I feel is in the non-scientific people. Is that yeah. the, my hypothesis? <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's, I would say, I, I have not, I have noticed some of those changes in sort of one on one interactions, I've never measured them. Um, the probably the best example would be my own father, um, who I've been working on for many, many years in terms of his climate change belief. Um, and, you know, realizing, you know, I started from a deficit model with him and sort of moved into talking about climate change without talking about it, right? talking about our shared values, um, which was sometimes hard to find, but, you know, was able to do it. And, um, and so I would say, but I also notice as I have adopted more of these kinds of tools, um, I, I just notice better audience receptivity, more people coming up to me at the end, more kids coming up to me at the end. Um, when I first gave some of these talks, I was, I was showing graphs and thinking, oh, you know, I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll just do a really good job of communicating what the graph is. Um, you know, a pollen diagram is hard for people, for, for my fellow ecologists to parse, let alone someone who's not in the field um, or not a scientist. Um, and, you know, I would get to the end of those talks and people would just start asking me questions about dinosaurs. And it was like, okay, so they just think they have a paleo person here who is just gonna answer all their burning questions about paleo. Nothing is coming out of the things that I just talked about. They obviously didn't connect with it and they're just taking advantage of me being here to ask their you know, burning questions about dinosaurs. Um, and so it was actually, you know, sort of, uh, there was sort of a, a breakthrough moment where I started talking more about, you know, work that was still in progress or questions or mysteries or my own journey. Um, my own personal story that I started realizing, okay, people are responding to that more. Um, maybe I should be doing this in my other kinds of science communication too. And so it was more of those sort of one-on-one -on -one interactions of just like, how is the audience responding? Are they asking me things about what I just talked about? Or are they going completely left field um, just because they have a scientist in front of them? Um, and and that those kinds of interactions I think have helped reinforce or, or helped, helped shape my movement towards more narrative elements in, in storytelling. Thank you. Yeah, but I don't have quantitative data. I haven't done any studies. Um, I think it would be really cool to do, um, but it's a, it's a whole, I mean, there are people who do this work and following their research is, an, is, is a lot. I think I can do one more question and then I have it. Yeah, I was, okay, Sorry. yeah, I was, didn't want to like um, take too much of your time. I know you probably have to leave, but we have one more question here um, mm -hmm. from Haley who says, obviously science communication is extremely valuable, but it seems like the value gets lost in the academic world of um, H indexes and funding. It's not something that you will likely get your tenure, for instance. Could you speak about your experience convincing the higher ups that your time spent on science communication is time well spent? This is a great question also. Um, so first of all, I when I was interviewed for this job, I had a dean ask me about my blog. Um, it's like, well, does, does anyone read that? Like, what's the point? Um, and so one thing you can do, I have two, two points. One, learn to speak the language that the higher ups care about, which is money, right? Um, so yeah, so uh, metrics. I know how many people read my blog, right? Um, yeah, I've used, I've used these science communication platforms to raise $20,000 in crowdfunding for graduate student pilot research, right? Like that, that's the sort of thing that they, they're like, oh, okay, cool. Um, so if you can figure out like a way of saying, this thing I'm doing helps me do the things you want me to do, like publish papers, connect with landowners that allow me to get data access so I can write the grant or, you know, the broader impacts of the NSF career grant, you know, that they are happy that I got. Um, that's how you do that, right? Just speak the language that they want. Um, again, narrative, framing, storytelling, tell the story that is for your audience. Um, and then the other thing I would say is um, you can find jobs where this work is valued. Um, I'm very fortunate to be at a university where you know, it's a public university that's deliberate that's by choice um i wanted to be at a public university i have an actual mandate in my job to do work that's it's a land-grant university so i'm supposed to be serving the public and i do get evaluated on that for tenure um and so you know being in a place that 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 gets evaluated and valued um was a, del a, a deliberate choice that i made and so you there are lots of different academic institutions out there different types sizes kinds cultures um try to find the places that will value that work. Great. Wonderful. I'm, I'm Thank so you. Sorry.
I'm so sorry that I have to run, but please feel free to reach out to me on email. Um, I'm happy to, to chat or if you were ever in person in conferences again, please come up to me and, and talk. So thank you so much, Jacqueline. Thank you, Jacqueline. That was really thank great. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Here's all. Happy, happy, happy semester being over. <laughs> Yay. Well, that was a great end to the semester.